Okay. Welcome to Dumb Fight Fans To the Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast Your Fight Talk Authority Not to mention the most entertaining and talked about podcast With your kick ass host, Richard Ortiz You mad? Come at me bro And his loyal kick ass co-host, Senor Cole Escovito Streaming live and worldwide Coming to you all the way live from a little place somewhere in Cali. The Vitus Boys. Kick Ass Podcast. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Fighters Voice Kick Ass Podcast. This is the Kick Ass Podcast, and this is the part where, you know what, it's unfiltered. So just giving you some uh, warning, some room to uh, either turn the volume higher or lower. Uh, nevertheless, welcome to the show. Uh, with my co host, the one and only, the Apache Kid himself, is the Co Escovito. What's happening, Cole? Hi, right, guys. Hey, Cole, you know what? I mean, we, we, I want to save every minute, every second, man, because our, our, our guest tonight is uh, the son of a legend, um, of the late, great, legendary, which this Friday, you're going to have his life story nationally televised on Showtime, which will be aired 9 p.m. Pacific time. Um, it's going to be the unfiltered story. But as you know, Cole, Hollywood and, and directors and, and KP knows they can only get so much of, of the truth. They can only get so much of the livelihood where, where you hear the heartbeat, where you hear the blood flowing, uh, the smell of cologne, uh, the, the sound of, of a gym. But we got the closest thing possible that the whole world is awaiting to hear from the closest person to, like I said, the son of a legend. And I'm going to welcome him to the show, Mr. Hector Camacho Jr. Welcome to the show, Hector. What's up? That was up for Richie, brother. Thumbs up for Richie. Yes, sir. Appreciate that. So, so how how are we doing, Hector? First of all, how are we feeling, man? You're looking good, looking sharp. I like the yeah. little towel up there. <laughs> Honoring my father, the week of the Macho Man. We's Macho Week, so honoring him. I mean, I, I, I'm excited, man. I, you know, I'm happy. I feel blessed. Thanks for the support from the people out there. You know, it's Macho time, man. You know, this story hasn't been told. You know, so my pops passed away eight years ago. They haven't really been nothing out on him. So it's the first time in eight years that people are going to know about him, hear about him, and it's coming. It's still starting for the bank this year. And, and you, you know what uh, is, is uh, very good about this is the youngsters that only heard of him, they get to get a, a piece of him th this Friday. And, uh, you know, when I posted today, I, I really meant it. I mean, the man that changed boxing forever from yes. his generalship uh, behind the microphone, I mean – Conor McGregor got it from somebody. Prince Nassim Hamed got it from somebody. That somebody was the showman. Yeah, well, they got it for somebody. It, it, exactly. And in the modern days that we li live in, I mean, because we're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about some true stories. Uh, we're going to get Coe Escovito's uh, take on this as well. But today's era, and I don't like to use the word if he was alive today, because he is still alive today, because boxing honors him. We honor him as a, as a man. Uh he, he is not a shadow, so I'm going to correct that. He is a light, a guiding light to those young fighters. But can you imagine WWE would have ate him up? They would have loved him. They would have welcomed him. Um, he was just a showmanship. When, when you hear me say that, how does that make you feel, Hector? Uh, man, you know, it, it, it's, I feel happy about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored by it because my father really changed the game. He was the really the first self-promoted boxer. Mm -hmm. He bought the Flash. He was the he the Puerto Rican Muhammad Ali. Kind of like a entertainment pioneer, I guess you could say, when it comes to the boxing boxing industry. And, and, and not only that, he was a damn good fighter inside those ropes, a master. That doesn't he hurt. Brought, he brought his own style to the game, which is hit and hit and not be hit. 
Mm -hmm. That was his style. And you know, even, even the fights he lost, they had to beat Macho Camacho in his style. Macho wouldn't go ahead and fight your style. He wouldn't. He stuck to his guns. He stuck to his style. How much would be a Macho Camacho worth in these days now? I mean, forget about it. This is crazy. You, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm letting you go because you're, you're speaking the truth. And, and when you yes, speak it, it's not even you're speaking a, a, as the son of, of a legend. You're speaking back. He's, he's alive today. Uh, he is a promoter's dream. He yes. has changed the game of uh, video games, clothing, hairstyling. Uh, you know he would have made an album today. I mean, yeah, the macho man. Sky's the limit. Yeah, these times with social media, man, we know. You know, he, this was his time. You know, he was a man ahead of his time from the way he dressed, the way he fought. You know, and and you know, you see fights nowadays. By ninety percent of fights you see on TV nowadays, they all wear the macho Camacho training. I mean, trunks. And neither, no, no fighter said, you know what? I had to give a, a shout out or a thank to Hector Macho who inspired me with this outfit. No fighter saying that. And I can't blame the fight. But they don't know where it come from. The new fighters. Exactly, and it's time for you to educate them tonight because Friday we can only do so much, but they want to hear it from the mouth himself, from the person himself, who opened the doors, who put the flash, who put the tassels on the shoes, who, yes. who put the script, and you didn't know what he was going to come out with next once those doors opened and his song was hit. You was one of them, Rich. You drove all the way to, 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 to Las Vegas to meet him. You was one of them. And he inspired you as well. You being a Mexican. He is the Latino Muhammad Ali. You know, you're absolutely right, man. Drove all the way down to Las Vegas to stay in Vegas only four hours. Four yeah. hours yeah. to meet Macho and, and Julio and then bounce back. That, that was old school. I think we lost you there, but as soon as you can, just, just come back in. He was he was walking around somewhere. So he was either, like, in a building or in his house or something. I think he walked into, like, a – I think he walked into an area that just, like, you know, as you get some buildings that just got crap signal. Well, I think it was as he got all fired up thinking about his dad, that ring walk, and, and he did his own ring walk. He's probably outside right now shadow boxing in honor of his father with the flash. Yeah, well, he's geared up. What, where is he at right now, L.A.? No, actually, he's in Fresno. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm texting his people, and we'll come back on. And they're going to drop that documentary on yeah. Friday? Actually, it's a, it's a story. The difference between a documentary and a story, it's his story okay. told from start to finish. Uh, yeah, this Friday, and I believe it's an hour and a half on Showtime, uh, 9 p.m. Our, our time. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that, man. That, that's going to be uh, something to, to um, look forward to. Yeah, if you're, if, you're def if you're a boxing fan, let alone a Camacho fan, that's definitely something you're going to want to watch. Oh, I, and Cole, I mean, really, you, you got to tune in to, to appreciate what he's talking about. I mean, the man, he's the one who invented uh, the self-promoter. He promoted himself. every time. Yeah, that's what we were saying. Like, it, it was uh, kind of just a, uh, like Michelangelo, like a guy before his era, unappreciated his time kind of thing, because they he did. He was like a pioneer as far as entertainment went uh, in combat sports. Because, no, I mean, you had WWE, but that was expected for, for that. You know what I mean? That was it was an entertaining show already. It was already actor ish. So to have a guy uh, flamboyant like that in in boxing was uh, it was something you couldn't ignore. You know what I mean? Like you couldn't you couldn't be a commentator. You couldn't be a promoter and go, nah, we're not going to use that bullshit. They were like, dude, sign that fucker up. Dude. We need to get that guy on because he's the one that's going to bring the fans. He already brought the cultural fans over. You know, we already know what their cultural heritage is and how strong that is and how much of a following he has based on that alone. So you combine that with now people that are entertained where they're used to just getting dudes walk out and just, Urgh, you know, and then you got this dude walking out who's just like, what time is it? It's fucking macho time, you know? So it was something that was new. It was different. And you usually probably got people that didn't want to mess with that back then because it's like, uh, like that Moneyball movie, you're trying to change baseball. You're trying to change boxing. No, he's trying to do him, you know? So that was where I don't think, like, you know, like I was saying, I don't think he's really was appreciating his time as far as that goes. That was a real, like, entertainment approach to a combat sport that no one had really taken before, at least not outside of, like, WWE and stuff. Well, I mean, you never knew uh, what was going to come out next out of his mouth once he was on the microphone. He also promoted himself. 
he, he never got rude or he, or he never uh, did anything that he shouldn't have done uh, behind the microphone. He handled it with respect. He, he knew he knew the system. He knew the uh, – when I say the game, because box isn't a game, but he knew the program and the protocol, and he knew what the people wanted to hear. And uh, just, just, you know – Not even – it wasn't really so much I think he did what he think he – what like what he wanted them to – what they wanted to hear. I think he was just going to do it anyway. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think, like, no matter what – he was going to go out there. He was going to wear the headdress. He was going to wear the chain. Like, I don't think it was so much a matter of, like, what the people wanted. I think it was what he he wanted. And when he was like, you can fucking live it or like it or leave it. Yeah. And they fucking gobbled it up. It's macho time. Yeah, see? That's what I'm saying. It's like you have promoters that had never dealt with that before. So now you got a guy that's coming into boxing going, what fucking time is it? It's fucking macho time. So to have a guy just flamboyantly, like I said, we were talking earlier when we lost you, to be that flamboyant and that alive, you didn't really see that outside of WWE or movies or TV. So to have that, it was like different. So it's like they wanted it, but they were like, oh, fuck, okay, what if that blows up in our face? And they were like, so what? It's a win-win. Even if it ends up not being things, people will want to watch. So, and it was just like we were saying, he, he was a like it or leave it type approach to his entertainment approach, his persona, so to speak, is what we were trying to talk about. Huh? He was cool. He was yeah, he raw. was raw. He was, he was he was he was he was real. He was raw. He didn't try to pay cater to anyone. He didn't try to like we were saying what the, what we thought the fans wanted. Eh, it was more so what he wanted, and he was like, "This is who I am. I don't give a shit." I can only so, so, which you have to be that way. That, that, that was buoyed up by confidence because the confidence made him feel like that. Yeah, yeah, about, exactly. He believed in himself. He was a big um, Bruce Lee fan. I mean, you know, he used to fight in the streets every day. My father was raw. He was a street thug. He was a bully. You got to you gotta be a bully sometimes in that sport, man. It's a combat you sport. Them, you can't be a nice guy. They'll kick your ass. Yeah, you got to. I see all these MMA guys sometimes. They're all, they're super nice guys, but they still approach it with a sense of, no, I'm going to try to tear your head off. Yeah, like, yeah, you, yeah. Have to. you have to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what, you know what, Hector. Um, he was once compared to uh, the, the Liberace of boxing uh, on on his walkouts. I mean, just just masterful. And it wasn't that. Hey, uh, I'll settle for anything. No, he wanted everybody to be surprised. Uh, never wore the same thing twice. And and I mean, people had to wonder, bro, who who hooked up your garments? Who hooked up your wardrobe? And and how do we, how can we do it? People used to go to the fight just to see his show, just to see how he's coming out. They go to the press room just to hear Macho talk, just watching him. He, he, you know, he, he was entertainment. He was pure entertainment. That's, so, um, that's why Jason Mayhem Miller had so much success in Japan. That same approach that, that his father had was they, they loved it. He was an entertainer, and he just did all that, and they loved that in Japan. That's why he, that was one of the reasons why Jason was so successful, but only in Japan. Did you ever Ooh. notice that? It was, it was, he was more of an entertainment scene, so... When he did it, they watched. So when promoters see that, they know the fans are going to want to watch that. Well, well here, here was what people couldn't control. A lot of people, honestly, as, as you know, Hector, people paid to see him lose, to get beat up. And yeah. after, you know, after they were disappointed, after two or three times, they became uh, Hector Macho Camacho fans. They, they had a respect, one that he's never been knocked out in his life, had an iron chin. I mean, the guy can just – I mean, that's one thing that gets overlooked. In history, he has to have one of the best chins in boxing – uh, boxing high uh, high IQ southpaw and and people forget how fast he was and his footwork was freaking phenomenal. His timing, everything. You know, I always tell you, my father is the American dream. He, he was born in Puerto Rico, came to New York at the age of six, made it to the White House. President Reagan invited him over to meet him. That's an American dream. Coming to this country, I speak English. Made it to the White House. That says it all. That tells me that anything is possible. No matter where what war could like to come from, from the ghetto, from the suburban neighborhood, from anywhere. That's the American dream. I mean, the man. Well, the man walked around with confidence. I mean, completely yeah. confidence. And and uh, um, you met my friend Bill. I remember you signed his son uh, Ryan's baseball. Remember, uh, we were at Al's house. Oh, we were a eating. while ago. Yes, a while ago. Big guy. Yeah, he was with me one of the times when we went down to Vegas. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story. And uh, KP's probably popping up those those, uh, those pictures. Yep. You know, I will say ahead of time, yeah, I was 300 pounds then. Uh, believe it or not, yes, I was. Yeah, yeah those, do you, you chunky monkey on that one, man. Yeah. But, 
accomplishment, man. Big accomplishment. But but nevertheless, uh, Bill said, he said, hey, man, who's that brave little dude right there? He goes, who's this dude right there? Because we were there, we were, uh, Lennox Lewis was walking around. He had other people walking around. But they were all there for Lennox Lewis and 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 so forth and uh, all these other names. And all of a sudden, down the hallway with a small entourage, what time is it? Motto time. Mot and he comes coming down. And he didn't disrupt it because everybody honored it. The press went crazy. And my buddy Bill, he said, who's this brave little guy right here? I mean, just walked around like, come and get it whenever you want. It's fine. And you felt it. You felt the energy. You felt the all around them. You just felt his presence. And, and everybody around believed it. They, 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 they were on. They were on the ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Hector, grow, growing up, I mean, you know, a, as a child and, and just walking around, what, what do you remember the, the most about, about your dad, you know, as, as far as like, okay, he has another fight, sitting back and, and watching your father on, on TV, and, and just all these fans just screaming and, and, and going crazy. How did that make you feel knowing that, okay, that may happen, but at home, he's still dad? You know what? It, it was a kind of, um, Macho was, my father was, like you said, a superhero. That's why I did the book, Macho Dad. Um, when I was young, I had a lot of resentment because, you know, I came out the project of New York City. Spanish Harlem. I had kids who pick on me. I was bullied when I was young. You come out your son? Yeah, let's fight. Let's see you come out your son. I just get that a lot. I also, I also, also get, um, you come out your son? How your father fighting for minutes on HBO and you, and you live in a project? See, always. So it, it had its pros and its cons. At the same token, I had people every time walking the streets in New York. People would stop me, man. The people would stop me. Yeah, hey, come out your son. Have an autograph. Have a picture. I just always get that from a young kid. So the love always been there, but you resent me for me you know, doing, doing those years that my father was never around. Where is he? I see him on TV and he come around every here and there with that, but give me Ferrari, see me, give me a kiss and leave again. Um, I had a lot of resentment growing up, but as I turned pro, I understood his lifestyle. I understood how it is now. I understand. Flying, charity. You don't have time for nothing. You got to dedicate your whole life to this. But, um... It was this amazing feeling, man. It has a pros and a cons. I mean, the good thing is, everybody knew who I was. I was coming out to you all. I was accepted. But the bad part with the con is, I have to live up to those shadows. It's not easy. You know what I'm saying? Any junior going through that child ass, whatever it is. So you have a great father. See, people, people fail to understand. People like Macho Camacho, Sugar and Leonard, Christian Chavez. Those are fighters that come every hundred years. Fighters are born every day. But those type of fighters are not born every day. So it's kind of unfair being a junior because you got big shoes to fill, man. It's unfair. I had an excellent career. I had 59 wins, 6 losses, and an excellent career. But those are big shoes to fill. So people never see that. I mean, they'll just say, oh, your father was great. You know, it's unfair. But at the same token, it's a blessing to be compared to my father. I knew coming to the sport of boxing that I'll be compared. But my goal was to become world champion, become better at home. My goal was to be known for myself. Because from small, I was always pointed at, let's come out your son, come out your son. I didn't want to be come out your son. I want to be Hector Jr. That's Hector. That's Hector Jr. And that's another question, Rich. My father had a brother who was a world champion. Who's the champion? Hey, Felix Camacho. How many people remember Felix Camacho? Not a lot of people remember him. I didn't want that happening to me. I, I remember Felix. Felix was, I believe, fought at, uh, I want to say, featherweight or just uh, flyweight. Had that you're long. You're a boxing Bible. You should, you're a boxing Bible, Rich. You're a boxing Bible. Of course, you know, but the, the, the normal fan boxing fan don't know. I didn't want that to happen to myself. So I mean, I've been in my my point, my my, my um my job's been known for me. And you know what? I'm in the boxing business. I may never, I would never become as good as my father. But outside the ring, I will hold that legacy and run with it. My goal do much more than he did outside the ring. And that's my goal, to keep that legacy going. I mean, it's not, it's not a shadow, it's a blessing, it's a light. It's not a shadow, it's a light, you know, the Camacho's name. Oh, it's a shadow, it's not a shadow, it's a light, it's a blessing. There you go. It's still Macho time, man, it's still Macho time, you know? <laughs> good looking kids, it's still Macho time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, 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 it's in there, man. And, and you know what? You speak the truth, Hector, and, and I appreciate that. And we're going to go wherever you want to go, my man. But one thing I, I, I do want to ask you, and, and, you know, sometimes they may be some, some tough questions. So if you accept to, to say, hey, pass that question on, you know, I, I, I hear that. It, knowing you as a person, you up front. You don't hold nothing back. So get busy. That's who you are, brother. I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's so much I'd like to ask you, man. And just, you know, I mean, w when did you realize – Hey, my, my dad is special because you would see other fighters. When did you realize? When did you recognize his talent pool? I always did, but when the day he passed, that's when I said, "Damn, my father was big." The day he passed, the reception, 
the funeral, the cause. Like, I gotta call, I gotta call yesterday for Al Jazeera. I'm Muslim. And that's a blessing. But I gotta call my Al Jazeera, another, 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 another country. For the Middle Eastern country calling me to these film, to, to interview with my father. So that says a lot. He was no, he's a brand worldwide. You know, legends, legends like that ain't never die. Legends like that they never die. So, you know, it's, you know, it's good, Rich. It's a good feeling, man. <laughs> and and you're, you're absolutely right because he fought not only in, check this out, Cole, he fought in his era, but he fought in the eras afterwards and afterwards. I mean, he fought that even the show. Never got knocked out. Boy, De La Hoya. In the hood. Exactly. A young De La Hoya. He was a killer. He was on my pot buff in the first round and couldn't stop him. Trinidad. Chavez. A bunch of them. And none of that. My father didn't live that, that clean lifestyle either. Let that forget that also. He lived a little. He played hard. He worked hard, but he played hard as well. He wasn't a disciplined fighter like one would say. But one time to train, he trained. That's just that talent he had, that blessing he had. And it's a dome. It's, it, it, it's a God-given gift that God gave him. And you know uh, as well as I do, uh, Cole, when you're at that level, it's, it's hard to stay focused and stay hungry. When, when you've reached the, the championship status, you kind of ask yourself, okay, what more, what other step can I climb? And, and for him to continue to be relevant throughout his whole career from start to finish, I mean, you're listening to that, and, and how do you feel about that accomplishment? What, what's, what's your take on that? I mean, just from yeah, that's, that's generation. That, that's like a big hole that a lot of champions will fall into. Like, uh, take GSP, for example. They'll get to a point where they, they're really, really good, and then they win the belt, and then all of a sudden it just somehow turns into, I don't want to beat you. I just don't want to lose. And that can become really, really boring. And that's kind of the route where a lot of people saw GSP going at one point. So to, to reach that type of spot and still, still fight guys like you're fighting for the belt every single time, which, you know, that's how you should treat it when you're at that level. That's kind of what kept him hungry. You know what I mean? That's where he kind of stood out from the rest is, you win a bell, now you kind of get lazadaisical. I think that befalls a lot of guys, and that's why you see belts change hands so many times is because they can't even defend it once. They've gotten to the pinnacle, they lose that fire. Even if they didn't lose it on purpose, something changes. You reached you, you reached that point, you know, like it's you got that goal. And now what's the goal now? Well, the biggest goal is to get the belt. Keeping the belt is cool and good, but it doesn't have the same uh, attainment reach as getting there. Like that's a mountain you climb. Now you're on top of the mountain. Now you're just now you're just trying not to fall off. That's hard, but I don't think there's as much um, sexy appeal. I guess is what you want to call it. There's not you're not gonna chase it as much. Right, 100 percent right. You're 100 percent right. Just getting there is tough, but once you get there, that's the tougher part. Yeah. Not to maintain it. My father did it for years. Not yeah, successfully that. too. Was so. Three-time world champion. That was his goal. He was three-time gold medal champion. But he went and proved him to become D-Town world champion. And he stuck, he stuck by his guns. You know, he stood focused. And after D-Town, after he beat Ray Boomer Mancini for the third world championship, he kept on going. He kept on the lights of Chavez, Trinidad, and Hoya. Then he kept on Duran, Leonard. I mean, he had a couple, kept he, he had a couple with Duran. What kept him alive is his personality. Because you're a fighter of fighters. After you're done with boxing, that's it. People forget about you. 90% of fighters end up broke. They all broke. We all do. We have no insurance. We have no um we have the 401k plan. We have nothing. Oh, there's no but retirement. It's how to be irrelevant. Macho found a way to keep himself relevant. After after the boxing lifestyle, he went to TV. That's a persona. Yet I had that in you. He knew how to market himself. He knew what it took. You know what, what? What was he like on on a daily basis? Before we we move on to to some uh, different topics, what was he like on on a daily? I mean, j just holding himself up as as the champion outside of the ring. Anything How was he? Anything outside the ring? Spontaneous, fast, spontaneous. Hey, let's go. Jumpy, hyper, happy. That was him. All time. That was him. But then toward the end of his, his lifestyle, you know, way confident he had accomplished, he got to a state of loneliness. He was lonely towards the end. He wants to be by himself. He don't be bothered by a lot of people. He doesn't stay indoor a lot. You know, and, you know, I, I see a lot of change from his life from the beginning to the end. Um, I can understand people. Oh, but your father, your father take drugs, this, 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 that. That was your way to get away from everything, you know? Um, but by no means, you call him a, a, 
a cokehead? Because you cannot accomplish everything you accomplish being a cokehead. No way, no how. Can you accomplish everything you accomplish being a druggie? It's not, it's not even possible. But um, the macho man was special. Special. The outside of the ring, inside of the ring, had a great heart. The people loved him. Wherever he went, they loved him. Doors were open. And, you know, that, that, that says a lot about a fighter, you know? That says a lot about a person. You get to that fame, you get to that level, that kind of fame that he achieved, and still being grounded, that, that, that says a lot about somebody. It, it does, Hector. You know, um, some, some um, followers and, and some fans, uh, they put some letters together, I mean, some questions, some qu kind of questionnaires. And one, I'm going to start off right off the bat. This is from the legendary uh, Lee Samuels from Top Rank Boxing, who's a, who's a friend of mine, and whenever he knows um, – you know, it's funny because he doesn't have Instagram, but he knows what guests I'm going to have on. So he says, hey, make sure I, I get you a question. And one thing about Lee, he'll call you at 2 o'clock in the morning. The man has no clock or whatever. He just, whenever he feels, and wants to box him. And, and this is uh, both for you and your father. He said, Macho Camacho Sr. was one of the best fighters of all time. What did Junior learn from him? What were his father's greatest fights? And, and which his fight videos do you look at and learn from the most. Okay. Um, I want to start with the last question. What the fight that I see that I learned the most was the Chavez fight, the Chapo fight. It showed balls. He had balls. That's something you cannot, you can't, you can't buy. You can't, either both or you're not both. It. Even through his defeats, he was happy. Even through his defeats, he still some style and grace when he fell in the ring. He must have lost, but you see, you see his grace slipping, getting out, holding. You, know, you, you see grace in him. Um, and the first question, what was it? What the most thing I learned from my father? You, yeah, what did you learn from your father's greatest fights? What did you learn from that? Keep going forward. Keep fighting. Keep believing in yourself. He never stopped believing in himself. And we all go through, we all go through phases in life. When we reach a point, you know, we stop believing in ourselves a little bit, you know? Life takes to a point that, you know, you're like, oh, man, you know, nothing working out. Nah, he always, uh, he always uplifted. He always was happy. And I just always watch him, you know, even when he trained. He trained half dancing while he training. Yeah. He was happy person. Yeah. I said, wow. Exactly. Guys, you train pissed off. I got to lose some weight. I go to the back, frustrated, pissed off, hitting the back. Not him. He was always happy dancing and hitting the back. So I learned that from him. Train with love. Train with love. Believe in yourself. Well, here's somebody that believes in you because his second half of the question is 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 100% belief in you because he says, "Ask Hector, who's his trainer, and where are is okay." This is what he said, "And where are you boxing next?" Which is addressed to you. Who's your trainer, and when are you boxing next? I have a trainer. If somebody, if somebody asks you that, Hector, that's a Hall of Famer. It's because they believe in you. Yeah. I was that believing enough when I, when I was boxing in my days because Chavez never gave me a chance. When they had Chavez Jr., I give me Chavez, then they give it to me. I mean, you know, um, I'm still working. I'm trying to get myself back in a position to fight again, a big fight. Hopefully this Showtime, you know, this documentary will help me push my name back out there so they'll see me in a different light now. So I'm, I'm waiting until everything settle down this week from Showtime. I'll be back in the gym. I'm pretty sure watching documentary is going to motivate the shit out of me, you know, so... Yeah, I'm ready to come back. I'm, ready to come. I'm still young. I still feel good. So I'm ready to go. Right on. This is from um, Eric Hernandez, who, who's affiliated with the boxing world. He goes, this is my best memory with his father. We were in Detroit after he beat Alkins. And we were all looking for a place to eat. It was very late, and he invited us to his room. And we had some random place bring us tons of food. And he made sure we all ate well. He was very humble and treated treated me and my camp with lots of respect. That's who he was. When that's that's another part of my answer I was gonna tell you. When Samuel Lee Samuel asked me what that must learn from my father, how 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 humble he was, man. Humble man. I seen my father stop at a red light, arguing with a homeless guy in the street. I gave you money last week. What you do with the money? He got the car, started arguing with a homeless guy in the street. I said, Mom, what you doing? The light the light is green, let's go. Shut up, wait, wait, wait. You argue with the guy in the street. That's about what you doing. Take some money out here. The last time I give you some money. Take this twenty dollars. You better not spend that. Come back tomorrow. You better have some money with you. When I seen that, I said, "Wow, either he's crazy or he's just a fucking good man." <laughs> hey, I think that's I'm like, "Wow, wow." He would never. If he's in a rush, much can have a picture. He would stop. He would stop and give you a picture. He didn't care. He was up and down to earth. When I see that, I'm like, "Wow, wow." Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. And, and when they're talking about memories, 
you know, I, I started thinking about this, thinking about the show today, and I was thinking, well, what's my best, uh, favorite memory? You know, I, I got some that I've watched on video, but there's some that, that I experienced on my own. And, and when I experienced this one <clears throat> particular memory, you got to remember there was no cell phones. I had a, a camera where you got to put the, the film in there and then click it. And then, you know, there was, no, I... there was no speed in it. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you a true story, man. It was, a, it was a Don King production. We're at the, we're at the I want to say the MGM. No, no, we're at the Mirage, I believe. And it's a Don King production. Julio Cesar Chavez is on the card. Your father's on the card as well. Now, they had certain area where the fighters were trained. Well, uh -huh. they overlapped one. Uh, senior just got done uh, working out. That was your dad. Now, uh, Chavez is coming in, and they already had their first fight. Now, Julio Cesar Chavez, he comes in. He recognizes who's in there. And I remember he's yelling, macho time, macho time, with his accent. Your dad looks at him, right? And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right? So then your dad's jumping rope, and then Julio kind of passes by him and kind of bumps shoulder to him. Your, your dad wasn't in the mood for that. So he said, que, que. You know, he was telling him. So then, then you're, and then, and then the whole crowd came there, and I'm getting all happy. I'm like, oh, I mean, I can never rewind that. There, there's no footage of that. Nobody had a camera or nothing. The fans went crazy. So you, your dad left, but your dad uh, was smiling. Now, now check this out. The story's not over yet. Julio Cesar Chavez, he's training, he's sparring, he's in the ring now. Maybe his third round of sparring for the fans. Hector comes in. He's hiding in the freaking crowd with his headgear on, with his gloves still on. Never took them off. Oh, shit. After, after he closed sparring, came in the ring, snuck in the ring to spar with, with, with Julio. Like, come on, come on. And they were stopping him. So now your dad's playing to the crowd. But I'm thinking, I was getting goosebumps like crazy. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, is this going to happen right now? It wasn't staged. It, 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 you know, I get nervous just talking about it. I couldn't take any pictures. The only footage I do have of, of the crowd kind of breaking them up, man. But uh, that was my fondest memory. It happened. I was there. It was It was live. And there's no footage of it. It's just just my story because I was there on location, man. And no, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, gotta be there, kind of moment. The one of the funniest stories I've seen was we was at um, we was at we was at Atlantic City, I believe. And my father was online getting food. Lavi Holmes' wife was there. Lavi Holmes was there. So my father passed by Lavi Holmes and his wife. He skipped them. He went to the buffet. He put his finger. He put his his hand to the beer chicken. Bit it and put it back. Like you always didn't like that. He told us, like, ah, ah. I don't even remember. There was a fight my father fought. He said, I want to call your name. But now I want to go to Laddie Holmes. That came from that. You know, it's funny, you know, but, but it's real. It's raw. I remember that. You know, I want to bring this up for my friend Bo. Me and my friend Bo Bernstein, we were watching that on HBO. He said, I want prior, I want Brabble, all you. And when he said that, I just looked at my friend Bo. I looked at his dad. And I was like, Okay, I guess that's why it's HBO. You can say and do whatever you want. But Hedger didn't skip a beat. He was able to get away with that word. You say that today, you get murdered. You lose your life. If you got no background or no, or no street uh, uh, respect, you lose your life over that. He said it on the air, accepted it, and went with it. Yeah, remember, we come from New York City. Us Puerto Ricans, we have black. I mean, so, you know, we, we said to each other. It's not, that's the New York slang. We said it to each other. I didn't think my father said it in a racial way. But he did say that directly towards them. You want them to know that, you know, he ain't playing. It's macho time. And I understood that. And they respect that from him. That's who he was. He don't hold nothing back. He was raw. You know yeah, what? I love it. Yeah, I love it. You know, and, and during that time, there was one fight that got away. And, and everybody wanted to see him and Aaron Pryor matched up. It, it never happened because of different weight classes. But that's one that, that I was looking forward to. And, um, you know, he was getting ready to take on Limstone Bramble, and, and he got stopped. You know, Bramble got upset. Uh, I mean, was, was Abby, stopped him. I remember, Bramble was a bad man, but Abin finally was, uh, was a killer. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. He also, also going to fight Bobby Chacon when he first won the first world championship. Bobby Chacon making the title. They ended up fighting Bazooka Limon. I mean, there's a lot of good fights my father wanted to do, but now Woody was another one. It yeah. never happened. Yeah. Exactly. Another one, my father. He didn't care. He, he fought whoever in his times. He didn't come up soft like these fights nowadays. Booking and record. He fought everybody. Greg Covington, this guy, Lou Lloyd, this guy, that guy. He fought everybody. Pretty fun. Um, Greg Hogan, all of them. Greg Hogan would just, yeah. I mean, a, a mess. He tried to get under your skin. And, uh, you know, Hector, Hector wasn't having that.
Greg Hogg was a pretty good fighter. You look at Greg Hogg, he probably won't surprise you. Well, yeah, he's okay. He was a damn good fighter in his days. But, had, uh, a lot, had, Greg a lot had a lot of heart. Huh? He had a lot he of heart, too. Yeah. I think he beat Jimmy Poor, didn't he? He beat Jimmy Poor. Yeah, 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 he did. He, he beat Pazienza. He's a decent fighter. See, all fighters back in days, all fighters back in days, they had to fight you see nowadays. Boxing had lost a lot. A lot they have lost. But, hey, you know, there's still good fighters out there. There's still interesting fights out there in boxing right now and days, but nothing like the old school days, man. Nothing like it, man. Cole, there was a fight that was getting matched up, and I was excited for this fight, and, and it was v Vinny Pazienda. Vinny Pazienda had fast hands, hit hard, but when he fought Hector, those fast hands, they looked like they were just moving in slow motion. Because you think this guy's fast, and then he got in there with Hector. And I remember after the first round, if you listen, if you remember that fight, Hector, what does he say to his corner? He says, he has fast hands tonight. He, he, uh, Vinny Pazienda told his corner about Hector, he has fast hands tonight. I mean, and he knew that he was just out, out with him and he just outsmart him. And that's well, because I don't predicted that Pazienda would be my father ever fought. You know, Pazenda was in a no pushover. He yeah. came to fight. He tried to rough my father up a couple times in that fight. My father stood to his just stood focused, stood to his guns and for his fought and for his fighting, won the fight pretty easy. And I was a bad boy by the end of this day. Bad boy. Oh yeah, especially his whole story. Uh but oh. Cole, you know when you have another fighter and you think he has fast hands, and then you put him in with somebody and it's just neutralized by just the guy's just faster and slicker than you are. And mm -hmm. the frustration started to set in on Pazienda. Yeah, you get some guys that'll go in there and they're the you'll have we expect this guy to be this way or we expect him to be this way when we go in. And you're hoping he's this way, but when you show up and he's this way, you're like, shit. Okay, so he's on his shit tonight. What how do we want to address this? We're gonna have to go to plan B because we're not gonna outspeed speed him. So what do we do now? And that can get real frustrating because you may not have an answer for that. When you don't have an answer for that, you can get real frustrated real fast because then you don't know what you're going to do to finish him, let alone how, how do you stop him from finishing you now? No. Scared and frustration. Yeah. yeah, great legs. His legs get him out of trouble. Yeah, the footwork, the movement, move, move, move. The ability to lean your weight quickly. Like being on a motorcycle. The ability to lean real quick, real fast. Like that kid, uh, Aiden Tao, that we had on that one time. That young teenage car rocket rider, the racer. Like, you got to really be able to shift your weight real fast. You got to have a good core. So, being able to move your weight and shift it around real quick on demand, dude, that makes all the difference versus having to react to their punch and barely getting out of the way versus getting out of the way because you wanted to. You know, <laughs> big difference. Big difference. It is. It is. It is. So, my father had that if with legs and, 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 and um, his reflexes, man, were awesome, man. Good defense. Yeah. He was what you call a disciplined fighter. His hands were always up. You never see him come out with his hands down. A disciplined he fighter. Yeah. Off the basics. He'd counter you, man. He, too. When you would pop that jab, he'd counter you right off the top. And a lot of – what you don't remember is, is, is Hector had a, a big back. He was very strong. He would impose your will. Even though he was he was set, he was stout, and he was very balanced, but his strength was in his back, was able to give him to move out and get that pop on the other fighters. A lot of people just thought he was flash, but if Hector wanted to sit down on his punches, you you were going to get hit. And uh, Ash Sugar Ray. No, Rich, I've been, I've been doing a lot of interviews lately. Nobody has mentioned that, and that's the truth. He did have a wide back, broad shoulders. He did. He was solid from the back. He's the first person told me that. That's the truth. He was solid. Well, you're on the fighter's voice, bro, and the only voice that matters, man. And uh, we're, we're, a good we're, eye. Good we're making out the competition. I've been doing a lot, a lot of people in boxing for years. I mean, reporters, and they never mentioned that about, about their legs, hand speed. But he made something crucial his back. I always said he had a wide back, big back, wide. Interesting. Yeah. Power. That's that's part of the reason why the man's never been knocked out before. Uh, and, you know, he's been knocked down, but he's never been hurt. The only time he was hurt was was against, I, I would say, was Rosario in the, in the second round. But but what did he do in the third round? He came back and dominated the third round. It, it kind of woke him up. You know what I'm saying, Cole? Is, is once a fighter gets hit, he gets dropped, now he's away. It's like, oh, shit, what did I do? I, I should have finished him. All I did was either piss him off, or now he's more focused and he's on my ass now. You could have had a couple guys. Yeah, we've had some guys on our team like that. They, they were just we, – uh, we had El Burrow, uh, Pat Murphy. You, dude, you, if you dropped him, 
and and finished him, you win. But if you did not finish him, you were you were probably in for a bad time. Is that then he would wake up and then he would be pissed and he'd be like, "Oh, you gonna fucking hit me, dude?" And he would just get mad all of a sudden. We're like, "Where was that three t- three seconds ago? How'd you go? Be- you got dropped. You should have got dropped. Now go get him." So if you could survive that, then you were good. But if not, he was coming out. That's all there was to it. No, it, exactly. And uh, one thing about Hector is just just longevity, man. Uh, you know, I want to switch it up and ask you this: when, when you knew that they were going to come into. Uh, I don't want to call it a documentary because it, it is called a, a, the story and there, and there is a difference. There you go. There you go. There. <laughs> I got to do is diet Balan now. I'm there, but I'm there, yeah, about there's it. One in the back, And then the one in the back too, right? I can't do that. I can't do that. Yeah, exactly, that, that long one. Now, when you knew they were going to put this together, I knew you were excited about it, but at the same time, you had to be concerned a little bit because you wanted to make sure that they showed the truth. But at the same time, uh, the ugly truth is, is what it is, the ugly truth. But yeah. at the same time, I know you wanted to get your, your father's story out. How much of, of, a, of a say did you have over this? How much of a hand did you have on the script? And are we satisfied with the finished product? Like I tell you, buddy, I'm the macho man now. And I, my father left. I'm, I'm the macho man. Um, you know, I, I, I've, been getting a lot of, I've been getting a lot of phone calls, man. You know, my father passed away. I've been getting a lot of calls. It didn't father's movie. It didn't be father's show. I was, I was holding. God. Nobody can match my vision, what I want to put out there. You know, everybody knows who he was as a fighter, but as a person. I want people to know who he was as a person. That's my main goal. So I got a lot of offers. I turned down a lot of offers, man, until every draft came up. Every draft was a guy who was in boxing. He actually promoted my father versus Leonard, along with Mike Aker and New Contenders. He's part of the promotion team. So he knew my father pretty well. Um, and I feel comfortable with that. Also, every draft also did a couple of badass documentaries. I mean, he did one with um, Noriega from Panama, which a, it was a kick-ass documentary. So when I seen that, I said, hey, this this the guy. So I put my trust in Eric, and he ain't even wrong. He did a great job. My family seen this, the, my family seen the doc already. They happy about it. I can't see. I'm not ready to see it yet. You know, Richard, it's still emotional for me. It's tough to see him. I like to just, you know, let it, let it be and just hear the reaction from everybody else and hope everybody enjoys it. But I, I'm not going to watch it. I, I can't do it. You know, it's just too, it's tough for me at this point to watch my father, you know? Because if I see him, then it will be like that he's gone. But as long as I don't see him and keep pushing forward, he's still alive. I know exactly what you're talking about. Trust me when, when I say that. Yeah, exactly. You know, Rich. You, exactly, Rich. So our job is to keep fighting, keep going forward, and never take the time to think about it. Oh, my father's going no. What I'm gonna do for him? Keep his legacy going. Like you do, thumbs up for Richie. That, that's for you, keeping him going. Right. Same thing my macho man, look. This keeps me going. It I is. don't like this shit, but it keeps me going. Hey man, that's, I, I can concur. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I, I wanna ask you one other question, then, then we'll move away from this. How, how much of, of, of a vocal voice did you have on, on there? Um, oh yeah, I, I was a consultant. I, I was taking the director and the film crew to the order of crucial points, to the police department, to the air of father hanged out. I was a consultant in, 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 in the in the dock, and um, I basically put everything together, basically along with every draft. You know, I, I introduced the people I talked to, people he needed to interview, who was close to my father, his friends, his family. So I, I basically had a big input in it. I did. And I'm not going to ask the stupid question that all these reporters would ask. They would say some cliche like, oh, I bet that was tough on you. Well, that's a stupid question. We all know that. And, and, and I say that because I'm going to move away from that. How much uh, pride did you have in that with the finished product, knowing that, okay, I gave everything that I could to this movie. There wasn't anything that I, that I left out or there, there wasn't something that I wasn't satisfied with. And there had to be times when something was brought to you and you said, okay, no, we need to fix that or let's move away from that. You know what I did? I, you know, I, I'm hella critical. I'm a burgo. I'm a perfectionist. Um, what I did was, I said, every draft, you do everything. I, you know, just do it yourself. I'm going to be biased. That's your opinion, my father. I'm cool with it. Do, do what you got to do. I give, I give him the hand, you know, free hand, do it, you know? Because everybody got their own opinion of Macho Camacho, their own perception of how he is. I got mine, everybody had theirs. So I let him do his work. That's what he does, his cup of tea. You do what you got to do. Do what you gotta do. I always seen everything. I seen the doctor. All right, cool. He didn't focus on the drugs. He didn't focus on the outside of the ring. He focused on boxing who he was. I, I, I'm happy with that. And leave me space for me to do other things. Because they show one side of my father. There's a, there's a thousand stories of Macho Camacho. Everybody got a story on him, you know? So 
I'm assuming mine's to the right time. I'm going to ask you this. Okay. Now, now we're going to make the Hector uh, Macho Camacho story. You. Who plays you as an actor? That's a tough one. I don't know. That'd be some good looking kid that would go fight. I mean, that, that's a tough one. I, I, I wouldn't get that far yet. You know, I would fucking, who, who would play my father first? Um, who played my grandmother, the niece, the, the parts, the main parts in the movie. Um, who would play your dad? That's a good one. I'm still out there searching. Man. I can't find nobody else playing play my father better than myself. I mean, I know you, man. Exactly. I, I say we sit down with Charles Tremley, a uh, uh, nutritionist, get you uh, back where you need to be, and, and you play your father. They can have somebody playing him in the beginning, in the middle, but at the end, that's a no-brainer. Who else plays Hector Macho Camacho other than yeah. you? I think it'd be a good fit, but then again, I'm not, I, I can't tell the director that I want to be my father. I can't do that. I got to audition for it. But yeah. not, and that's part of the process. That's the protocol. And I'm cool with that. My main thing that if I play the movie or the movie's about me or if I'm getting the money, my main thing is story done right. For his legacy. It's done right. It's not about the money. Because Rich, it's about the money on a bitch on the deal. I've been holding off on the movie deal for a while. Because it's not time yet. I, I don't have the right people in place yet. I want to do my father justice. It's not a money grab. I want to do them justice. How has this, how has this week been, been for you uh, emotionally, spiritually, and, and just feeling, you know, like, like we're moving on to this next chapter? We never move on, as you know, but just moving forward as if to say, okay, it, it's a breath of fresh air for me. I mean, as far as me, on my to-do list, I'm checking everything. I did the Macho Dad book for kids. Check. The Macho Time book for adults. Check. The documentary, check. The movie, check. It, it, it'll keep going on. Um, I'm working vividly outside the ring. I'm working on putting out the school program in Panama. Name it the Hector Macho Camacho Boxing Academy. I'm working hard to give back and bring light to my father in a positive way. Um, but I mean, it feels good. Everything's getting accomplished. Everything's come, it's happening now. Because I've been working for four or five years and finally paying off. Um, and that's my goal, to put my father's story out there the right way. Hey, you know, this is crazy. Uh, you know, yeah. fight is coming up. The sad thing is that these kids don't know who Macho the Macho is, but they will see come Friday who he was. They will learn today. Exactly. If they learn, they, they, they need to learn. And uh, they, they need respect. And, uh, you know, a lot of these fighters today, man, I, I – I wanted to hear from them, you know, what was their best memory? I want to hear Julio Cesar Chavez, what's his best memory? You know, even Felix Trinidad, uh, you know, some of these commentators, you know, I want to hear from them. And, and I'm curious to, to, to know because at the end of the day, it starts with the R, and that's respect. And I think he earned it. He earned it, the boxing. He gave love to the sport, the sport gave love back to him. I mean, every time, everywhere I go now, man, he's like, hey, you're fire. It, 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 it's love, man. It's love. It feels good, you know? It finally feels good that he getting just dudes, you know? It takes so long, but he finally getting just dudes. And it's time, man. You know, it's time. Not to be forgotten, you know? He's a pioneer of the damn sport. He's a pioneer of the game. He changed the game around. He opened the door for Oscar. He opened the door for Mayweather. He opened the door for a lot of fighters. How much would be, how much of much, much work nowadays? Oh, forget about it, Rich. <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Cope, you, you've been around a lot of, uh, of fighters where, where their, their fathers were, were, were legends. And sometimes, you know, just the pressure alone of, of just being themselves. How much have you recognized it in the sport, not just in MMA, but just any sport in general? Because you've been a lot of, uh, around a lot of legends in, in, in their, ch their children. Yeah, um, it's hard because you get a lot of those guys, they don't necessarily want the same thing for their kids. Like they almost like, like they want them to train, they want them to learn how to defend themselves, but they like really shy them away from following in those footsteps. Um, like Randy Couture's son is a good example. Like he was cool with it, but if you ask Randy, he's like, you know, I would have rather he did something else, you know, like not pursue a professional career. It's not that he can't get the good training and the correct path and all that stuff. It's that when you reach the level that Randy did, you know, how dark it is. You know the pitfalls. You know how the rarity is that you become that one in a million successful type athlete in that sport. So he knew that there was the success rate was very small and he didn't want his son to have to push through all that only to reach a certain point and then maybe fall and end up with like nothing to show for it. So I, I've, some I've seen pursue it, but most of the parents I've come across, 
they they really kind of like try to shy them away. They don't discourage it. If you want to do it, you want to do it is their approach, but they're like, well, I'd rather you did something else. Because they know there's no 401k. There's no insurance. There's no retirement plan. There's nothing. You blow your fucking knee out in training and you're not signed yet. Even if you're signed, even if you're signed to four or five fucking fights, UFC would be like, oh, that sucks. Bummer. See ya. Like, there's not, hey, here's $50,000 for not having fought for us. Good luck. No, it's nothing. Um, now, the UFC, don't get me wrong, they fixed my nose. They, they paid for that. But I was fighting for them. So had I, like, blown my knee out for some lower-level farm circuit show, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. So there's no retirement in the sport. So I, they, I've noticed them have the same approach that, like, I've had, is they tell their kids, do something else. Go get a degree. Go get a trade you know, be an electrician, be a fucking plumber, be something that has a career and pays, you know, consistently well. Um, but outside of that, they're supportive. You know, you can't really be much outside of that when it comes to that line of work. Hey, Drew, what's your advice to some of these fighters that, that are watching, that, that are into the sport right now, or even going to be born into the sport? And I'm talking about, you know, we, we may have some more that are sons of legends or, or, or sons of, of some great fighters and, uh, you know, not just to him directly. One, the only one that comes to mind right now is uh, Shane Mosley Jr. What do you have to say to these other fighters where the expectation, you know, of course, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., where the expectation is just so high, what advice can you give them in order just to try to be themselves? Because they can't escape it. Unfortunately, they can't escape it. You said it yourself. There's pros and cons. Yeah. I mean, just be yourself. You know, be the best way you could be. And your followers are great honor him. Like, for me, it wasn't no shadow. It was a light. I used that as a light, not as a shadow. Oh, I've been shooting for them. I've been, I've been coming in my phone. It, that's pressure. That's mental pressure. I don't want to live under that. Hell no. Nah. So, I mean, be you. Be free. And for young fighters, learn how to pocket yourself. Take courses, financial courses. Learn yeah, how to read. Go money. back to math. Go back to school. It's yeah. going to be needed. That's the effort we have. Most of the fighters, they come from nothing. No school. So we take advantage. They, they use it. They exploit us. Get sharp. Get a good team around you. Let me give you another example. Um, Floyd Mayweather, they become Money Mayweather until you got a good team behind them. So you got Al Heyman. Then he became the Money Mayweather. Then the money took off. But before that, he would barely fight, barely pack out the paces in the arenas. Fight on Top Rank show. Barely packing them out. But so you got a good team around them. So it's very important to get a good team around you. Crucial. Have, it's good to have people who has money. Have people who are looking for money. Get with people who has money already. They don't need your money. They just want to help. You know, sometimes some, some us fighters, we get some of our people that just come to look for high tech money from us. That we, I could use them. I need to do my Camacho. I always kept an eye on it. I learned that from my father. I always kept an eye on people who are around, who's around me. I always kept my circle small. Now, that's, that's very smart. I'm going to ask you again, and then, then I want to talk about, about your legacy and, and your career. What did you, and you, and you just uh, said it right now, what you learned from your father as far as that, that keeping an eye on things and keeping your circle small. What did you learn from him that today is just so valuable that you want to pass on? Because if you're willing to pass it on, it, that means it's very valuable. How to keep yourself relevant. How to market yourself. How to make small moves. How to get the attention. Not in a bad way. How to get good attention. How, you know, be different. I learned that. People like, and people don't understand, but their life was different. That was the same thing. Mix it up. We all, you know, unique. We all, not everybody's book smart, but everybody talented. Everybody's creative. Find that niche that works for you. What works for you, Hector? Be me. <laughs> be me. Be humble. Be simple. Be funny. To be myself, you know, uh, and, and I give thanks to my father what I've seen from my early age that it makes me the person I am today, mature. I don't get excited for a couple of things. Not all money's good money. That's right. So certain things I've learned, that every offer's a good offer. You know what? If, if you can become a boxing coach or, or a commentator or continue to stay in, in – in the sport, now I'm not saying that it's time to hang up the gloves, or I'm not saying just to put the gloves back on. What what circuit or, or what avenue would you want to stay in is a good fit for you inside the boxing world? I think being a promoter, 
because that's part of who I am. We promote ourselves. We market ourselves. And me being a fighter, I know what the fighters need. I know what boxing needs. It needs a big change. And, and I could think anything to get back to boxing, it'd be the promotion aspect and really help the fighters. So you got promoters who market their promotion. They don't market their fighters. They don't promote their fighters. They promote their promotion companies. And that's a big difference. They got fighters like Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar De La Hoya promoted Canelo. He promoted Ryan Garcia. He don't promote Golden Boy. He promote his fighters. That's a big difference. Oscar was a fighter, of course. So he understands what it takes, how to promote a fighter. So, I mean, I convince a lot of fighters of how to, how to market themselves, how to dress a press conference, how to carry yourself around people. See, there are a lot of thugs in boxing. You don't need no thugs. You need an uplift in boxing. You need a change in boxing. A cleaner version in boxing. Sell. Household name, things like that. Guys you can market to, family. Speaking well. Yeah. Give Guys respect are, to one another. Yeah. Good role models, things like that. Yeah. It's a good investment. It's a smart investment. And he, he it makes sense. He would be in a position to teach them, especially younger fighters that they'd be recruiting, how to approach the game correctly to have a future, have something past boxing. You know, hell, you could be the first promotion with like a fucking retirement plan. You have a That's set purse exactly in your contract. A percentage of your purse gets put aside, and it goes notebook. into That's an investment fund or something. Because it, it it is messed up that we have to giving ourselves twenty thirty years to the sport, getting beat up to get a job after your fifty, late fifty six, get a job. No. Well, you know, you know I, I I gotta ask you about this, man. I'm mean, the whole world tuned in, and uh, uh, it did very well. It did I'm mean, very well. I mean. Uh, the sales were, were high before the event even started. And I'm talking about, what was your take on uh, Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson uh, climbing back in the ring after all these years, after this time? Hey. Mike Tyson. For me, it's exhibition. I knew the exhibition going into the ring. As a fighter, I wanted to see where the guys were at, at their age. And I got to say, man, I take my hat to both fighters, man. Tyson looked okay going in the ring. Shaky looking good. Roy did too. Those are two boxing greats. I take my hat off. That age to sacrifice himself. Going in the ring put a show on for people. I think they did a tremendous show. Those are two brands. See, that's all about boxing brands. Those are big names. Household names. Those people draw that kind of, that kind of interest in it, you know? And all they mixed up with Snoop Dogg and Dog. They mixed up with some, you know, with music. That's the right, that's the future of boxing right now. Boxing is supposed to be an event, not a fight. An event. Exactly. Mayweather brought an event. De La Hoya did an event. Macho Camacho, an event. Mike Tessa, an event. Charlotte, events. event. It's events. What, what was take? No, it's exactly. What was your take? Because we went over and we talked about it on on uh, uh, Blake McKernan. On, on his hey. album. I... I, I, I Kind of knew Blake didn't have a chance, but I was praying for Blake, for Blake to survive, to survive the fight. While he got out of it, he lost, but he gained a lot of respect from that loss. So now he's in a better position from losing. He's in a better position because of his heart. Now people will fight Blake. Now he's a name. Mm -hmm. Before this fight, he wasn't a name. If I got knocked out, forget about it. He's done. But he survived. He now took that act like a like man. Either. Yeah. He deserved to fight it on. He deserved to fight on. He took the ass with like a man. He deserved to fight on. Mm -hmm. I salute him. I was I'm, like, God damn, damn, that, that hurt, damn. <laughs> but hey, he kept on fighting. Mm -hmm. A military man. He dies in a ring, honor. Hey, get the game. We need more Blake Griffin. We need, we need more Blake McCurry. We need more fight like that. Entertainment, entertainment. No, you're absolutely out class, right. out class, but didn't stop. Absolutely, absolutely. Some, some room for improvements, yeah. But now, now everyone knows who he is now. So you get the B level fighters, not the body Dak, the body Dak. No, the B level fighters, C level fighters, they might want to take, might want to fight Brilliant now. You no, know? he does open up. Mm -hmm. He's definitely gonna learn from that. He's definitely gonna learn from that fight. Keep his head up. Keep going. He should be super proud of himself. He should be oh, proud he's of been, himself. To he's been. Uh, I've been I've been looking at him on social media and stuff. He's been pretty aware of where he fell short and what where he's grown and the improvements he's made and now he's got even more room to grow and he seems pretty okay with the scenario as a whole. I mean common sense, you think about it, 
They can blow in the middle of Badu Jack. Not all. He'll blow in the middle of hey. He got in there. He did it. He survived. He fights every other day. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I, I like the fact, uh, or I had my respect, that first of all, he accepted the fight. He didn't make excuses. He didn't say, okay, uh, maybe next time. Uh, he embraced it, and nothing changed his demeanor going into the fight from, from the regular fights. I noticed at the press conference, talking to him, nothing changed. And to me, I said, okay, that's a plus side. You can't even tell that. He, I, didn't see, I didn't see him nervous at all. I didn't see him get caught up in, in the all of it. Uh, of course, it was a big uh, platform and a stage, but uh, he did. you can't ask him to do any more. He did the best that he could do with what he oh. had. 100%. It's all balls. 100%. He fought a world class fighter. Badu Jack is a world class fighter. Big, naturally bigger man too. That, that now that he's uh, not, uh, letting himself grow where he needs to be. Badu Jack has no business at 168 anymore. Uh, maybe 175. Yeah. He is now a full blown cruiserweight, and that's the division he's going to continue to fight on, and, and possibly win a world title, and be, be become a, a three time three division world world champion. So there's no harm or foul on that. I mean, how many people can? And you know, and here's the thing, you know damn well Balu Jack wanted to look good on national TV. So there was no carrying process or nothing. He tried to he get tried the hard. He tried hard, delivered to the body, which was his game plan to break him down, get him out in the second half of the fight. If it goes there, it, it just, hey, it didn't happen. So if anything, Balu has been scratching his head like, God damn, I hit that with everything. He don't go down. God damn. Yeah, he, he, he put forth an effort that his intent was to finish Blake. Like, Badu oh. went in there with the intent of, you don't belong here. I'm going to finish you. That's all there is to it. And he – I don't think Badu has the same opinion now of him. I don't think he thinks he doesn't nah. belong here. Now he thinks, okay, I threw – I like you said, I threw everything I could at this guy, and he didn't go down. Okay, he might belong here. He might actually – he walked the walk on that one. You know what I mean? So it's like not every win is necessarily a W. And this was one of those moments where – we went in there knowing there was a chance we could lose kind of thing, but the goal was to put the beast out there. He wanted to make sure people knew who he was. He took a risk on a risky opponent and did what he was supposed to do. Like that would be like the whole blueprint. I think that he was looking at from game one, you know, if I were a fighter, I'd be like, dude, this is all wins for me. I, it, it's even better if, if I fucking deliver and do beat him. And if not, it's not a bad, you know what I mean? It's not the end of the world. This was all, this whole thing turned out awesome for him. He earned my respect. I'm pretty sure he earned Badu's respect, too. I mean, Yeah, oh, hell yeah, he's got Badu's respect. He's got a lot. He picked, he picked up a lot of people's respect that night. A lot. A lot. Like I said, there were so many people that were like, dude, you're just going to get rocked. You're going to go I'm happy for him. I'm happy for, I'm happy for him. That's a true underdog story. I'm happy for him. I didn't want to see him get knocked out. I want to see him surviving. He better survive. He's better survive. Hey, I'm happy for him. That's, that's what you call a fighter. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. You're, you're right. Um, Hector, I got to ask you about this weekend's fight coming up. We got Danny Swift Garcia take, taking on, I mean, who, who are, could be pound for pound, arguably the, the best in, in, in the world, and that's Spence. Uh, there's a lot of questions there coming off the, the car accident, uh, coming off the layoff. What can we expect Saturday, and how many rounds will it take Spence to get back into, into the swing of things? You know what? It's an interesting fight because um... – and I give credit to, to Spence coming back and picking one of the top dogs. Danny Garcia's an interesting fight because Danny Garcia is not what you call um, – he has great timing. Garcia has great timing. But Spence's basics are just good. His basic is just good. He knows how to fight. I mean, you see him last night with Porter. I was playing, he look good. He fought Porter's fight, but nobody looking against Porter. But when it comes down to Spence – he does all the basics right. But it is a risky fight. You find a live guy, Danny Garcia, who had great timing. It's a risky fight, definitely risky fight, but I like Spence in the fight to stop him in the middle rounds. I think Spence is a good fighter. Long, he'll use long reach. He'll use that deal, work behind the jab. He'll pound that body. You know, that's just how I see the fight going. No, but then again, he fight a real world to it. He fight somebody that's strong and solid. He's not finding Mike Garcia going up in weight. You know, he's going to fight somebody that's solid. So, interesting fight. Very interesting fight. 
You know, that says a lot, uh, uh, what, what you said, because Danny Swift Garcia, is, he's never been knocked out. He's never been stopped in his whole career. Oh, and has to, he has to be hungry, Cole, because this is his – it could be easily his last hurrah at a world title. Uh, I know he's very talented, very young, but because of the whole COVID thing, because where we are in boxing, we're just not giving out world title opportunities. This is no, – yeah, it's – and, and, and plus, they're trying to market people. Yeah, they're trying to market people right now. And if you don't win, they're going to move on to the next guy. So they can try to market him. So if he wins, they've already built up a little bit of a brand behind him that people can follow. Yeah. And, and boxing. right now, every promoter, every company, and, and I hate to say these terms, everybody's cutting the fat. They don't have time yeah. to, and we don't have time. I mean, these fighters are under contract. We have to fulfill our obligation. We got to get these guys fighting. Um, I don't have time to build. I'm going to stick you in with the dogs to see wh where you're at. You know, there's only a couple promotions that are, that have been, uh, Pretty consistent, and I'll say top rank. I mean, they're doing a great hey. job uh, with, with their young fighters, and they're keeping them relevant. They're keeping them busy, and but at the same time, they're they're moving them up. And being busy is a good thing in boxing. No, of course. And when you mentioned top rank, hey, they done a tremendous job. Top rank been doing this from from for years now, and to see them still see Bob still getting things done at this age at this time, hey, that says a lot about top rank. A lot about top rank. Exactly. And I'm not taking it away from the PDCs or, or, or the Golden Boys or, or the Match Room. I, I'm just saying for, for, for me, as because I'm also a fan, they've just been consistent. They, they've had fights and, you know, like a fighter, they throw punches in bunches. And look at their body of work. They know how to groom fights. They know how to make stars. They know how to create and make stars. One after another. One after maybe with the quarter the whole year. One after another. That's what they do. What about your boy, you know, from the islands, man? I mean, this big middleweight, Berlango, man. I mean, I mean, the guy's just bombing away. I mean, what's your take on him? You, you also got our, our kid here from Stockton. You, you got Gabriel Flores uh, uh, Jr., who now, uh, as you know, added Andre Ward on, onto Pretty the team. Pretty good. Yeah, on, onto the team. And you got these young cats out here, man. I mean, Shakur Stevenson. He's about hey. to get the whole script. Uh, the good fighter. Good fighter. But let me tell you something about the Valley in Fresno. The Valley, they're producing good fighters here, man. I went to the gym with Al, Jim Logo. I mean, he got some good fighters in that gym. Rob Garcia County, he had good fighters in that gym. And then when you go here, you go even the amateur level. You got to fight, ah, oh, man, good fighters. The Valley here got a good, a crop of good fighters. Look at Jose Ramirez. God damn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He's always been a producer. Always been a producer. Whether it's agriculture or ass whoopers. It's just what the valley makes, man. Players, football, the guy from Buffalo, Bill Josh. I mean, mm -hmm. hey, this, this area here, oh, man, yeah. I must say, man, the I got to give my hats to Fresno, man. In the valley here, you have fighters down here in Bakersfield. You have fighters in the area, man. The future of bright for your guys here. Future of real bright. And it's bright for the fighters' voice, too. Because you got all these fighters coming to your head. You need to be all these fighters, man. You know, looking good for your guys. Well, I mean, and we're, and we appreciate what we do have, man. We, we really do. And uh, in 2021, we want to turn it up, man. But uh, you're as good as your last fight. And, and, and having, uh, you know, I, I've addressed you and, and I even asked you. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to ask, the, you know, I don't care if the whole world knows. I asked you. I, I said, how do you want to be introduced? I said, because normally I would introduce you this way. I said, but because of what we're promoting, because of the memory, because of, of what's at stake, I prefer that we do it this way. But I wanted you're okay with that. And, and remember the conversation we had. I said, Rich, it's an honor to be called the son of the late great, I tell you. It's an honor. It's the truth. It is. Not everybody could be, could be called that. And uh, yeah, you talked about, um, you know, even Frank Alamon's gym. And I don't want to overlook uh, his young heavyweight, who's an amateur, uh, a, a jet uh, Blackwell, who was uh, one of three main sparring partners. Sparring partners. Tyson help him get ready. Uh, Mike Tyson acknowledged him after the fight and said, I want to thank my sponsor yes. who ended and mentioned Jet from Fresno, California, trained with Alamon and Alamon's boxing. And uh, the young uh, lad himself is getting ready to make his pro debut soon. Dope. It's exciting. Exciting. It is. It is. Hey, I want you to stay on the line right here. I want you to continue to stay here, man. But I, but I got to turn it up just a little bit here. Cole, what do we got bouncing off of the MMA world? Um, it's been a little quiet. We had the, some dropouts. We were actually looking forward to the Leon Edwards okay. fight. That was going to happen, but that's off now due to C-19. That got pulled. Um, I think Edwards 
yeah, Edwards got sick, I think, with C-19, or one of the one of the close camp members guys tested positive for C-19. Um, so that fight's off. That was going to be, I want to say, an upcoming UFC, like ESPN card is what that was going to be. Um, they keep trying to push the Khabib return um, with Poirier and McGregor fighting each other. They're like, oh, do you want to fight the winner? He's like, I don't care. Um, lately, Khabib's biggest thing though, is that he's been trying to push this new Eagles fighting uh, championship. It used to be, so a lot of people are going to think it's new, but it used to be guerrilla fighting championships. It used to be branded under something else. He just bought them and just rebranded it. Like, why build everything from the ground up? Why not just buy an existing brand that's he on C19 defunct? He did that for his close fighters that are around him. That's his way. Yeah, of exactly. Yeah, he's going to try to build them a brand in order to showcase, get some experience, build a record, find out who's really good. And then at that point, he'll probably just filter them in to the contender series or into the UFC or LFA or some other organization that will give them bigger name experience. Um, and then not really much else going on. There's really not much else. Um, we're gearing up for like upcoming UFC fights. We're going to see Holloway fight again. Um, not Holloway. Uh, I'm retarded. Um, uh, not Holloway. Um, who am I thinking of? Why am I brain farting on, on him? He, we, I, oh, Ferguson. Why am I brain farting on that? Ferguson. He's coming up with a fight soon. They're going to be co in that Poirier-McGregor um, card in January. And then, um, oh, that's one thing I wanted to bring up was a suspension that happened. Now, this is going to be kind of a no-name guy. Um, it's uh, Mark andre Berriolt. I want to say he's maybe French, Canadian maybe, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, he got a win on UFC on ESPN 11 back in June. Okay. Dude's had four fights in the UFC, three losses in a row. He was on a little bit of a, hey, we're probably going to cut you, you know. So he wins, finally gets a W. Unfortunately, that got overturned over the weekend, and he got a nine-month suspension for protesting positive for something that you're, quote, not even supposed to ingest, and they don't even allow it in the country. So probably was using some kind of a steroid. I mean – and this is, this is what I was talking about. This is why I bring up this, this article, because no one's really going to know who he is. It was real low level. But here's the thing. With USADA and all the testing and shit, you're going to have to see more of this. Dude was on a three-fight losing streak. I guarantee. He's not Clay Guida, okay, who's fighting soon again, by the way. You're not Clay Guida. You're on a three-fight losing streak. You're getting fucking cut. You're getting cut. So... You're Mark Andre. What do you do? Fucking anything you can to keep your job. So what do you do? You do a little extra to try to give yourself that advantage, and it clearly worked. But then it gets overturned. Now it's a no contest. Now you're definitely getting fucking cut. So you take a guy because of USADA that was on the ropes already, already on the chopping block, trying to do what he could to keep his dream job, which is fighting in the UFC for fighters. He did whatever he could to, to keep that job. Do I agree with it? No. Do I condemn it? No. I just think Usada needs to just get the fuck out of the UFC and MMA and let these guys do what it is. Everyone's pretty much doing it as it is on some level now. In, these, in this age, on some level, majority of them are doing it. So if the competitive level is already up here, and you're busting your ass to try to catch up to it, and you're never going to fucking catch it no matter how many hours you spend in the gym, what's the point? USADA and the rules and the regulations basically punish those willing to take the risk to do what it is to be as good as they can. At the same time, you're fucking over the dudes that are genuinely trying to do it, but they're never going to get there. So you, dude got fined like $2,600 fucking dollars and is suspended nine months. He's getting cut anyway. The next time we see Mark Andre fight, it's going to be either not at all, or it'll be for a lower organization. All, what did Assad accomplish there? Ooh, you caught the big bad guy. Fuck out of here, man. All you did was end a guy's career who was trying to do anything he could to stay in the win column and keep his contract. That's all Assad did in this one. They didn't protect anyone. They didn't save anyone. They didn't do shit. I'm sorry, but I'm just over USADA and shit like that. So no, I that's mean, why I brought that up. No, I mean, that's that's what people want to hear. They want to hear the truth and exactly how someone that's involved in the sport and how they truly feel. I, I do want to say this, man. How does UFC and Dana White 
I mean, what did they say to Conor McGregor? Okay, you're matchmaker now? He created this fight. See, that's what I said. They, they painted, he painted him into a corner. He, he, he put it together. And now it's not just a fight. It, it, started, it started off as, okay, I'm going to go do – it's not a fight. It's an it's a, a, a exhibition. Now it's a legit fight. He shot called this whole thing, gave it life. It's breathing. There's now a card there. It, it is what it is. He's still doing what he needs to do as a showman, uh, showmanship promoter. Got to stay relevant. Yes, and that's what he's doing. I would be willing to bet him and Dustin, or at least him and Dustin's management, one of the two, yeah. had a conversation, and Connor said, look, I want to fight in the UFC. You want to probably get a big payday fight. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to concoct some non-existing card that we're going to fight for charity. Because here's the thing. At the end of the day, there's no fucking way – Justin's management would let him breach contract like that. You cannot fight for another organization while you are under contract. Good fucking luck proving me otherwise. So to be under contract with the UFC, there's no fucking way his management was going to say, yeah, go ahead and fight on Connor's card. That's a great idea. Bullshit. That's breach of contract. And then you know the UFC is not going to give him permission. So what happens? Connor creates this fictitious card that was never going to fucking happen. Puts the UFC in the corner to where now, now they have to either A, let this bullshit circus fight that's not going to happen, happen, which by the way, he tried doing that shit with Manny Pacquiao, fucking them dudes out there said, the Saudis said, you need to put those fucking posters and pull them now. You're not having any fucking fight with Pacquiao out here. We haven't agreed to shit. Pull those down. So he tried to pull that stunt already. Now with the Poirier thing, he created a card that wasn't going to happen, a fight that wasn't going to happen to force the UFC to offer Connor a fight. Connor didn't ask the UFC for a fight. No. The UFC came to Connor and said, Connor, would you like to come back? Would you like to come back and fight for the UFC? We'd love to have you back. Um, we'll even give you a fight. You can even fight Dustin. Like this was literally, like you said, Connor handpicking what he does now because he's relevant, because he knows people will probably watch. Just now, people will probably watch just because it's been so long since he fought Dustin that people legit think Dustin has a good chance of beating him because he does. I, that is a competitive fight I actually want to see. He's an improved fighter. He's not, he's not the same fighter. But he fucking retired. I'm talking about Dustin. Oh, Dust I'm talking about Connor. It's a retiring shit. It's, oh, yeah. But he got the UFC to ask him to come out of retirement. Do you see what he did there? The UFC asked him to come back. Yeah, and that's, Hector, how it's, that's how it is. I wish Hector would, would uh, listen to that one because that's straight strategy, promotion, 100%. 1A. 100%. He flipped the whole script. He, he, he pulled a, a Camacho Senior on that and a Floyd Mayweather on that. He shot called and let the pieces uh, fall into place, and now he's back in the driver's seat. Speaking of, of in the driver's seat. Well, he's in that position, Rich. He's in that position. He's in that position. He auto shot. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Here's a scenario for both of you. I, I don't know how serious she is about this. Uh, I want your take, Cole, and, and I want yours, uh, Mach. Uh, as you know, Clarissa Shields – who is the goat of women's boxing? Um, she's finding out. <clears throat> I mean, hard for her to find the next person to uh, brutally knock out or stop or make look bad. Has signed with the MMA company. Now, is yeah. that to push her name, um, or is she actually going to put the gloves on? What, what's your take on that? Uh, she's put the gloves on. So you think yeah, sure. you think that cage door is going to close? Yeah, she'll put them on. She'll fight, but she signed with PFL. She signed with the like professional fight league or something like that. I think is what it stands for. It's it's a, mm. it's a farm. It's like a high level farm circuit show. You know, and this is nothing against guys that fight on it. I know a guy personally that headlines their card regularly. But the thing is, though, he's headlining. It. So she she should have really tried to get in through like. But here's the thing: she's just building a record right now. First, let's be objective about that. She is just trying to build a record. You don't jump into the fucking fire only to find out you're not fireproof. And you look silly. She's approaching it correctly. They're being smart. They're saying, look, okay, she wants to do MMA. Obviously, she wants to get into the women's UFC. That's She's not doing this to fucking waste her boxing name and not go anywhere with it. So she wants to eventually get to the UFC. But in order to do that, you got to build a little bit of a record. You're not going to get in the UFC having had zero fights. Well, farm system or not, uh, Hector, 
uh, you're entering an element that, that is completely different because now the rules change. The, the size of your gloves, now someone can kick you. Now someone could take you to the ground. Um, what's your take on that, her entering the, the cage for the first time ever? Uh, just, you know, changing the whole recipe, changing the whole script. How, how is she going to react to that? And, and what's your take on, uh, on, on if she'll be successful or not? Well, I'm, I'm sure she thought about it. She gave it several thoughts before she even signed the contract. So she did sign the contract. That means she want to do it. I mean, she got fabulous hands. So she thought about just getting down the, the floor, the groundwork together and Basically, you know, touch up on certain things that she don't, they, they don't, they don't work on. But with those hands, it's good enough. The hands are good enough. I mean, she want to challenge herself. I mean, it's hard for her to get fights. It's hard for her to get recognition in, in the regular boxing world. So she's crossing over. At least I think Amanda Surratt the same thing. It gets to the point that, you know, you, you want to be out there. You, you know, boxing, I guess female boxing is not where it should be. And I guess they want to, they want to, they want to challenge themselves. They want to. I mean, they're going move. about it the right way. They're not just trying to go for broke. They're they're trying to get her feet wet. She yeah. may do it and be like, ah, you know what, this ain't for me. All she needs is leg kick checks and a sprawl. And right now, I think that'd be enough to get her by, just to see if she actually can do anything with it. Because you put little gloves, I don't give a shit who it is. You put little gloves on a boxer that actually has a real boxing record, dude, she will fuck someone up. Like you yeah, put she... little gloves on a, on a person that like hits you yeah. hard on a regular basis and you're going to say yeah let's let's lower the padding on that that's a smart idea so she gonna fuck some people up it's just a matter of who do they give her like you want to give her someone that has almost little to no wrestling i don't want a jujitsu guy give they me a boxer or a kickboxing background they care that's about. the ideal opponent hey rich brother i get out of here i'm sorry brother. i get out of here i always draw my time talk to your guys i was learning new things from your guys i appreciate your guys much of time and you know what? I, okay, I, I understand. Give, give those 10 seconds right now. I do want to say one thing. Usually I kind of guide our, our guests any, any which direction that I think we should go. With, with you, I was letting you flow and letting you do what you needed to do. Uh, I appreciate you. I know you got a lot on your plate, uh, very busy. You got business calls coming in from, from uh, 24 hours a, a day, especially this whole week. And yes, uh, you know, we got an appointment together tomorrow, which I'll see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow. And uh, just to finish up uh, some more uh, content and footage that we got coming up, man. But uh, real quick, what do you got to say to all the fans and followers that that it's still macho time in their life, man? Yeah, you know what? Just enjoy it, guys. Enjoy it. You know, this is a rare thing you're going to see after our father's death eight years after. I mean, he's been away from the sport. He's been away from the limelight for a while. So enjoy this for your guys. Especially his fans. I want you guys to enjoy it and, and you know, laugh, cry. Like, I'll be doing it. Enjoy it. It's still lots of time. Yes, it is. Appreciate that, Hector. Hey, Thank we'll talk you, to you soon. I'll see you tomorrow, Rich. The finest voice, the only voice for your box MMA. Thumbs up to Rich, brother. Love you. Hey, yeah, Hector. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you, Hector. Cole, in two minutes before we go home, man, I mean, again, um, I think other fighters are going to gonna uh, pull what Connor pulled because – you know, I don't know. Yeah, which but here's, here's the thing: way. is they don't they don't have the draw power that he does. Like who who could pull off that? And the UFC would be like, "No, nah, go fuck yourself." There's there's really not anyone else out there right now, short of like Khabib. You know, you know, there's you know even Kobe fucking Covington couldn't do that. Nobody else would do it because the UFC would be like, "You're not going to breach contract, no." They knew that everybody was get, everybody got behind that Connor fucking fight and Poirier fight because it was for charity. It was this. It was that. Nobody stopped to realize he is under contract. This was a plan from day fucking one, and the only only reason it succeeded is because Connor McGregor is Connor fucking McGregor. If he wasn't the high level guy that we know, it, it, this would never happen. No other fighter could pull this off in the UFC right now. Dana White told him, go fuck yourself. Matter of fact, I'm not going to use you for a fucking year now because of that. Like, Dana would go full fucking mafia on you. Look at what they did to AKA when the whole gaming fiasco thing happened. Those guys were like, no, 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 you're going to pay us extra to use our likeness. And UFC was like, yeah, your whole fucking team's gone. Like, they kicked the whole fucking team out of the UFC. So if you want to go gangster heads up with Dana White, you're going to lose that battle. This is one of those moments where Connor knew he could do it because there was enough 
enough people want to watch him fight that they'll watch him fight anywhere. And he knows that. He fucking knows that. Why not use that to his advantage? And you know what? You're UFC right. to ask you for a fight. You're right. UFC has a good chin and it's in mm-hmm. his business. So they're, they're going to take it on the chin and, and move on. Well, hey, how are we looking for next Wednesday uh, w- with Blake? Is that uh, good. confirmed? Okay, good. I know Tuesday we got uh, Daniel Roman on, and uh, he's going to call out another fighter, and we're talking about from the Oxnard LA area, and uh, uh, we're going to have him on for about a half an hour, and then we're working on, on a big name as we speak. That's what I was doing, uh, looking at my phone, because I was uh, going back and forth on that, and before I reveal that name, I want to make sure it's concrete, because we don't want to sell wolf tickets, man. Mm. Welcome, how was your Thanksgiving? Everything was good? How the holidays so what? far, man? I went to Cayucas and got drunk. Okay, well, good for you. Yeah, I remember the, uh, uh, what was it, the hot tub incident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I broke a fucking glass. That was awesome. I set it down, and it fucking fell off. That's not my fault, man. That's... Yeah, glass, man. I mean, what, what are they thinking? Back to God. What are they thinking? Told, that was God's way of saying, bro, you're done for the night. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You can't put the bottle down. I'll put the glass down for you. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you someone who's not uh, done tonight, and, and I'm talking about um, Shelly Hollis, who's just been kicking ass with the fighter's voice. Uh, he's coming down tomorrow to do uh, an exclusive with, with, with uh, Hector. Um, they worked something out. He's coming down to, uh, to the Valley, and then he's going to smash back up to uh, the, the Turlock area, and guess who he's interviewing on the show? Um, Carol the Cut Woman. So, oh, cool. so that's good. Yeah. She's going to be sitting down and, uh, you know, it's all about expansion. It's all about the brand. And, um, you know, I've been in, in, in conversations where, with Ernesto, man, he has that Spanish voice mm. and talk about somebody who can run with the fighter's voice Espanol. It's looking good in 2021, my man. And, uh, nice. just sitting back. We also got some pieces of the puzzle that we'll be putting together, but, uh, that, that's it for me, man. Uh, you know, I appreciate Hector coming on and, uh, you know, we had to make some uh, moves and, and, and make that happen. And just for him, what he didn't display is, you know, like anything else, uh, you know, there's, it, it's very emotional leading up to this week. But, but mm-hmm. he's on here like a true professional, like a true champion. And, uh, you know, uh, exit stage right. He made his exit. He came on, on here. And uh, we appreciate that. We're going to be watching and, and supporting and promoting that show this, this Friday on Showtime. Mm, yeah, no, it'll be good. It'll be a good opportunity. A lot of people that are even casual boxing fans, I think, should check it out. Because you'll get not just – Camacho's history and stuff, but you're going to learn a lot, I think, about that boxing era as a whole, I think, just watching that. So even if you're just a casual boxing fan, I think you'd benefit from watching it, actually. Well, if you and uh, KP get, get a, a a message about 1.30 in the morning, it's just me uh, texting you that private screening that I heard that's floating around. So we're going to see what we can do and make happen. Nice. I like it. Yes, but but no, it's a wrap, Cole. As always, hey, Cole Escovito, the UFC veteran himself, KP, the man behind the curtain, Rich Ortiz here, your host, bringing you the most. It's a wrap here. Thumbs up for Richie. Lysography at its finest. So on behalf of Richard Ortiz, Cole Escovito, the special guests, and all the crew right here at the Kick-Ass Podcast, saying hasta luego, babies. And always.